before I do that, let me let me give you a a simile of a of a of, a, of something that uh, I, I was involved in the past. Uh, I, I worked for a social media company that um, did a lot of um, uh, security work, uh, and this one company I worked for um, provided um, analysis of social media prior to let's say a, a sporting event, and one of these sporting events. Prior to one of these sporting events, a a gentleman got on Facebook and and uh, described how he was going to conduct some violence at this sporting event, and he and he stupidly uh, did a selfie with a picture of himself and the tickets that he bought. In other words, where he's going to sit. Um, so this social media company informed the security of the stadium about this, and. The gentleman sits down in his chair and, and uh, the two men on each side of him uh, say to him, we know what you're going to do. We suggest you don't do it. And uh, and uh, the guy was thoroughly uh, freaked out. And when he went back to his home, he posted on Facebook, wow, I'm never going to do anything like that in a in, in a sporting event. And, you know, so he perpetuated this thing. So basically what happened was because they warned him, they deterred him. He didn't do it. And so nothing happened. So I hope that this uh, broadcast uh, stops uh, uh, this event from happening uh, in the future, it, just like what I said with, the, with this event and the sporting event, because, because if people take action, there's a chance that it, nothing will happen in the middle, middle part of August. And so that's the that's the thing I want to just bring up. Okay, so now, well, hold on. This is brilliant. We we like we either get the the, the scoop of World War Three starting in August, the end of everything we know, and if it doesn't happen, we say, hey, we prevented it. I like it. <laughs> I and mean, the, all and all the and all the people, uh, you know, your numbers go up and everything. Everybody's happy, and you're uh, and. People become members of Patreon and, and and all is well. I do feel like that's a lot of pressure to put on this podcast, this YouTube <laughs> podcast, to prevent a, the the uh, Chinese invasion of a Taiwanese island. We're, we're putting this on all our promotional materials. We prevented World War III, assuming it doesn't happen in the middle middle of August. Then you right. could just cross out prevented and say predicted. predicted yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, either way, uh, down below is the link for uh, patreon.com slash China Unscripted. <laughs> oh my gosh! This is. Okay. I feel I feel really guilty right now. <laughs> Nothing's happening. This yet. is like okay. a fraction of what the military-industrial complex does. We're making just a little bit of money off war. <laughs> Good on you. Uh, Buy our t-shirts. <laughs> I support you. All right. Thank you. So how did I? L let me just uh, uh, get to uh, how I how I got to uh, my this conclusion. I'm going to take you through it. I'm going to include the the issue of the the, the rocket forces uh, that you brought up, Chris. So I, I started noticing that the, P, the PRC uh, was publishing uh, an increasing number of laws in the last three months. It was very unusual. Um, I'm working on another project, and I thought, wow, they, they, they just signed like six major laws in three months, like the law of the People of Republic of China on reservists, conscription, counterespionage, patriotic education, law and foreign relations. All these in the last three months, and so I started looking for other patterns and seeing if there was something else out there that I'm missing. Maybe there's a reason for that. You know, uh, uh, you might know that um, Nazi Germany, uh, when Hitler came into power, he he um, he actually used the law to enable him. So I'm wondering if these laws are enabling Xi Jinping and the CCP to create more control or, or, or do some actions in the future. So, so the new laws tipped me off, and then I, I looked I looked back at uh, Xi Jinping's statements, and I noticed that his rhetoric has become more and more warlike in the last three months. He's made some very strong speeches about, you know, to the people of the PRC, you need to prepare for for extreme such circumstances, um, you know, um, like uh, in in March he gave the the Great Wall of Steel speech and the unification of the motherland. Uh, in May, he, he warned China must be prepared for worst case and extreme scenarios. And in June, he said that it's imperative to prepare for extreme circumstances. And then last month in July, twice he said, uh, uh, once he said that he went, to, he went to visit the Eastern Theater Command. 
Uh, and he said that uh, training uh, must be done under real combat conditions to raise the capability of, to fight and win. And by the way, that's when one of the uh, generals committed suicide uh, 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 that, that you talked about. Uh, and then in, 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 towards the end of July, he, he called for the strengthening of the Communist Party leadership in the military uh, and that there should be absolute leadership over, over the military. So here we have a bunch of statements uh, that are pointing to a higher crescendo or a higher level of um, con uh, concern and you know, warlike speeches. Now, regarding the fired, the fired generals, before we get to that, we, mentioned, we need to mention the Minister of Foreign Affairs, right, uh, Chin Gong, who disappeared and then suddenly uh, was replaced. You know, in the United States, we have uh, three people that are key for decision-making, uh, uh, specifically uh, on the executive side. We have the, the President, the Secretary of State, and the Secretary of Defense. Those three are the ones that uh, are key for making decisions about war. Of course, Congress ha has to approve it. But in the case of the, the CCP or the PRC, Xi Jinping is both the political leader and the, the CMC, the head of the, 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 um, the, the, the commission uh, for, for the military, basically all the, 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 the DOD. And so the all, only other person that has an equivalent position, let's say, in terms of that kind of structure is the foreign minister. Um, so he, he now is in a situation where he... His, his appointed, his favorite, uh, let's say, boy uh, is appointed to be um, the foreign minister and then does something that needs to be purged. And so this is a bad, this is a, this is a black eye. Uh, this is something very bad for him to, to deal with. And then you've got this, some kind of a, a, a corruption or some kind of a, maybe a security leak of the strategic, ro uh, the rocket forces uh, um, where you have the, the commander, the deputy commander, the former commander, and the former deputy commander are all basically rolled up, and one of them commits suicide. Uh, and then you also have uh, another general, uh, Shang Hong, who is the deputy commander of the St Strategic Support Force and the commander of the Space Force. He's also facing investigations. So you have all these people sort of um, in a, uh, you know, PLA generals who, who obviously he doesn't trust, because now they're being they're being pursued for something illegal. Now, what's common about these guys is that they're all technocrats. They all have PhDs, or they're they're extremely good at the technology side of the PLA, the rocket forces, the space forces. These are all very technical positions. And so, what does he do? He replaces these guys with the deputy commander of the navy, who happens to be somebody who's very much uh, um, uh, in the, in the uh, let's say, uh, very politically minded and somebody he knows uh, from his previous experience. And then he picks a political commissar uh, who's from the Air Force, who's again a, um, a communist um, adherent. So he doesn't replace them with technic technocrats. He replaces them with people he, he trusts that will follow his orders. All these things are happening, which, again, further demonstrate that he, he is really concerned about the, the loyalty and whether or not the PLA will do its job. Given that, let's assume what I said is true, that he's very concerned about these, this military training and this uh, the supply thing, supplies of weapons, what, is he, what can he do? Okay. Now, obviously, he, he, I don't think he thinks that the PLA is ready to do an invasion or a blockade. Sorry to mess up your show, Chris. Um, it's okay. We can still have it in the title. <laughs> <laughs> we'll just be like, will China have a blockade invasion of China? Question mark. <laughs> will China invade China? Well, that, that's their perspective, <laughs> right? It's all that's China. Right. That's right. <laughs> so that's accurate. Go on. Okay. So uh, what are his choices? Okay. What are the choices? The choices are, um, besides doing what I just said is maybe take an island or two or three or all of them that are close to China or ones that are far farther away from Taiwan. I'm not talking about Pengu or the, the main island of Taiwan. So if you start looking at the uh, the list, uh, I'm just I'm just trying to put you down to the logic train here. Look down yeah, sorry, one second. So we're just going to put up a map on screen of the Republic of China and its 
outlying islands. Because a few years ago, we went to Jinmen, which is one of the heavily populated outlying islands. Formerly known as Kamoi. Yeah. Uh, and the Taiwanese government controls all these islands. They're uh, used for different things. Some of them have people living on them. Some of them are just kind of like military installations. But they're, they're n none of them are, you know, even compare in size to the main island of Formosa, which is what we think of as Taiwan. Right. And those islands you're talking about, the Kinmen, Kimoi, Matsu, they're, uh, you know, they're very close to the coast of China. They're not. You can see it. They're not. Yeah, you can see China, but you can't see Taiwan. Those islands were fought uh, for in the 1950s. Um, and set, some of them were captured by the, the by the PLA and some of them uh, fought val valiantly like Kinmen and the PLA was not able to uh, take them. But there are some islands that are not close to Taiwan, and there's two. One is called Pradas or Donsha. It's about uh, 240 miles southwest of Taiwan or 170 miles east of Hong Kong or about 400 miles uh, uh, north of the Philippines. The difference between this island and the islands that you just mentioned, Kinmen, Matsu, this island and the other island I'm going to mention have no civilians on, on them. They're just military on this island. Pradas and uh, Taiping Island uh, have no civilians. They're just, it's, it's basically a, uh, a military base. Now, Kinmen, you know, I think has about 30,000 um, people, civilians on it. And so, uh, you know, if you're going to attack an island with lots of civilians, that doesn't make good for, you know, propaganda purposes. And it's also a headache. Yeah. So the numbers are roughly, um, yeah, 60,000 civilians on Kinmen for example. And Matsu has 13,000 and, and Wushu has about 400. But the other two islands, Pradas and uh, Ituabu or, or Taiping, depending on uh, how you describe it, have no civilians on it. So that's why I think that if, if, if Xi Jinping has the PLA take either one or both of these islands, um, he can create leverage. Uh, he can say something like this, uh, you know, I've taken these islands that they're, they're, they're part of China. And if you want to stop this con uh, from continuing uh, for, for us to take these islands, we're willing to negotiate. But in order to negotiate, the Americans have to stop uh, sending weapons to Taiwan and they have to withdraw all their military out of Taiwan. And then we'll start talking. 